Mike, we'd like to start anyway. What do you think? Let's go. So let me formally welcome each of you along to this. Um, I've really, really been looking forward to this because those of you who saw my email, uh, which is part of our newsletter, would know that uh, Mike and I first met when I attended a conference in Sydney. And um, I hesitated when I wrote the email because, I, to be honest with you, I don't know if Mike was before me or after me, but nonetheless, we were either side of each other. And um, Mike was boom, beamed in via Skype. Now, I'd never seen this before. The only time I'd ever spoken at a conference, all the other speakers were in the room as well. This is the first time I'd ever seen anyone beamed in via Skype. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't have high hopes for this. I'm thinking, oh, goodness me, this isn't going to work. Um, I was dead wrong because it really did work. And I was gobsmacked, to be honest with you. It, it worked so well. And uh, I reached out to Mike afterwards to congratulate him. We'd not met prior to that. And um, we became friends. And uh, there was real joy a year or two afterwards when I picked Mike up in Sydney and we drove to the Hunter Valley where we both spoke, not via Skype, but faced in person at a yeah. conference in the Hunter Valley, which was a real joy. And I, I've learned how much value Mike can bring. Um, I don't know in detail his future story, um, intellectual property, um, very well at all. Uh, so I'm as keen as you to learn about this. So, um, Mike, it's a joy to have you here. Um, and I'm really looking forward to this. So, look, I'll be manning the fort for chat box. If you've got any comments or questions, please put them in the chat box rather than the Q&A. Put it in the chat box if you can. Um, Mike's going to share some of his um, ideas. And I know he's prepared some slides and that'll take 15 or 20 minutes. And then we'll zoom back out to have both of us on screen and um, we'll have a conversation both between ourselves. And if you guys want to get involved, we'd love you to be involved with your comments and, and questions in the chat box. So Mike, great to have you here. Just gone six o'clock in Atlanta in Georgia. Uh, welcome. A pleasure to be here again with you. Thanks so much. And welcome everyone from around the world. That's pretty cool. If you, everybody, if you don't mind, um, what do you think a future story is? Type that into the chat. And let's see what kind of thoughts that title brings up. We'll just spend like one minute on this real quickly. And again, go into the chat box rather than the Q&A. One of the things I've learned about stories is our, the company that I founded in 2002 is called Story Miners. And I've learned that when people want to hear a story, they really want to be part of the story. So the more interactive it can be, the more you make it with them, the more they like it. Just like little kids, when you're telling them a story and you make them act things out or do parts of it, it tends to stick a little bit better. So let's see what we've got here. So Mike, we've got more, more flexibility in the workplace, picture of what's possible, successfully sharing and learning together, mm -hmm. the story building a future vision and a shared vision. Cool. Those are great starts. Well, how about we start off with a few slides, get some of the basics out of the way, and then we'll open it up for more conversation. And Steve, you'll be the facilitator. Um, anytime that you have a question, please type it in the chat. Um, Steve's going to be looking at that. I'm going to be paying attention to what I'm saying. I can't read and talk at the same time. I'm just not that skilled yet. Uh, but Steve, please feel free to interrupt me anytime. Let's make this a conversation. But I think a few uh, basic points would be pretty helpful. Thanks, and Mark. by the way, when I'm looking this way, I'm looking right at you guys. I'm looking right at the camera. And I have some notes over here. So I'm not reading my email. I'm just staying engaged, but looking in a different place. <laughs> All right. So here we go. Let's start off at the beginning. Um, this uh, presentation is about gaining employee buy-in during the toughest of times. And Steve, thank you so much for writing the email that way. But we have really challenging times right now. But every time there's a challenge, there's also some things that you can do with it that can make it absolutely amazing. So part of a future story is about looking for the hope. It's looking for the opportunities and shaping them faster 
than your audience can think so that you can present them something that they go, whoa, I never thought about it that way. And then they're going to say, what else do you want? And you're going to be ready with that very next thought. And you'll be ready with two or three or four ideas. That's how a story rolls out. So if you do this, if you build a future story, you're going to be answering the question that's on everybody's minds, and we just saw it in the chat, what's it going to be like for me in the near future? If we weren't in a pandemic right now, people would want to know the same thing. We're changing strategies. We're buying a new company. We're shifting into a new geographic region. What's life going to be like for me? How's my role going to change? So for team members, if you're a leader, read the stuff on the left-hand side. This is what your people are looking for from you, and this is what a future story delivers. It's part facts. It's part design. It's part inspiration. But the most important thing of all is that when you tell a future story the right way, you're putting the listener in as the hero so that they're actually having an experience while you're telling a story. You're not telling a story. You're giving people an experience. That is really the most important thing I have to tell you all day long today. Remember Steve Jobs in 2007? That's when Apple's fortunes changed. Right about that time, the amount of computing power in the world switched from being used for science and business to being used for personal and entertainment. And Apple was right at the forefront of that. We, saw, we witnessed the launch of the iPhone. And Steve Jobs became famous when he introduced the iPod, the music device, and then the iPhone for his amazing storytelling skills. What do you guys remember about Steve Jobs' stories? Take a second and share that with us in the chat. What was he known for? What did he do? Just any little thing. Imagine that you're watching your favorite video clip or that maybe you were at a worldwide developers conference meeting. Just share any little image or any feeling that you had when you were there. So Daniela totally is fresh. saying totally fresh and new and engaging. 1,000 songs in my pocket. The element of surprise, the unexpected. He made you want what he was offering. Mm -hmm. Simply presentation on how the device would make my life easier. Inspiring, wanted to join in. Whoa. All right, now take all of the, this has never happened, Steve, but look at this slide. Boom, it's all right there. <laughs> wow. People are saying roughly the same things. So what was so amazing about the device itself was that it gave you the ability like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy or Captain Kirk on Star Trek. You literally had superpowers. The potential to have the world in the palm of your hands was finally made real. The people who are in the creative part of the world and those in the business part knew that they could work better. It was so easy to see how reaching out and touching someone was easy and fast and that you could share anything that you could see, send people a picture, you could share anything that you could hear. You could capture anywhere that you were. It was amazing on the device side. And people got really excited about his storytelling style because when he spoke, he would roll it out as if you were the center of attention. He wrapped the story around each of the 4,000 people sitting in the whatever city California office it was. And they were cheering. They would yell and scream during his presentations. They were so excited about what it would bring. Now, there's another part to the story that I think is pretty interesting. What Steve and his team did is they built the future. They didn't just talk about it. Let's compare Steve Jobs' presentation of the iPhone to John Kennedy's announcement that we would launch man into space and this was in the beginning of the 1960s, a few years before his term ended, unfortunately, by assassination. He said that we would send a man to the moon and return him. That was the key part, because it would have been very easy to do a one-way ticket um, by the end of the decade. And that set off a, 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 this incredible race, which the Russians at the time were already winning. So what he did is he promised what was to come, like most politicians do. Hey, hire me, and this is what's going to happen. But Steve Jobs did something different. He actually made the future real, and then he announced it. Here are a couple of the things that he did. He invented the App Store. That's the smart purchase. The smart purchase was that it was a multifunctional device. Apple had four different product lines, 
it blended all three of them into one. Any business professor from Harvard or wherever would tell you, what a stupid idea, you're going to sell less. Not so stupid. They sold a lot more. People instantly saw the utility. Behind the scenes, Apple invented its own app store. I believe there were predecessors to that, but the app store is the one that we all consider to be the founding app store. And Apple makes a ton of money off of that. A third of every single product sold goes into Apple's pockets, which is amazing. They've, they've just locked up all the distribution. Were they mafia, they'd probably go to jail for racketeering, but somehow that's legal. <laughs> and I think the biggest innovation in the Apple arsenal in all of the things they've done is the invention of the 99 cent song. Remember back to what it was like when you bought music. You'd buy an album on plastic or a tape or an eight track or a CD, but the music producer was the one who decided what you were gonna listen to and in which order. And it wasn't until very recently or very close to the time of the launch of the iPod that you could carry your music with you. you know? So now what Apple did is you didn't have to buy the whole album and you could carry it wherever and you could even share playlists with other people. They changed the music experience and they changed the buying experience. And to do that, they had to change the record industry. That was the hard work. But Steve Jobs' vision, along with his partner Wozniak and many, many hundreds of others, because he was not a cast, he was not a one-man show, they all made it happen. They even changed the way AT&T, America's largest telecom provider, and the only wireless provider when Apple launched the iPhone, they changed their launch schedule and rhythm. So they actually made AT&T work differently. So when you tell a story about the future that you've already built, it's just so different than when you tell a story of what's to come. So he put all the proof points of that right into his presentation. Thanks for bearing with me on that long part of the story, but it's foundational to what we're doing. If you're a leader, this is what you get from telling a future story. When you share more of the detail in a more convincing way, you shorten the time to launch because everybody can see their role in what they're supposed to do. They see the end game. They understand the outcome. And it's not like, give me 10% more of this or, you know, open distribution on the west coast of the country. That's not what it means. It's more about giving everybody clarity around their role and what the outcomes are so that as they figure out how to get things done, it's all done in alignment and it's all done in an on-brand kind of way. Stories also get repeated, and the more people repeat really good stories, the more people know them. It means more people know them, and the better they understand what that story means. Because at one level, when you hear a story, you learn something. And at a totally different level, when you repeat a story or when you start teaching it to other people, you learn even more. Excuse me, and you also create kind of a, a, a deeper context and much richer connections inside of your business. So Story's got a lot of things going for it socially inside of an organization as well. So my question to you guys is, how do you write your future story? Got any ideas for that? You don't have to type them in. I just want you to think about it for a minute. Where do you go first? Do you pick up your pencil? Do you think? Do you have a dream? Do you go get a carbonated beverage? What do you do to kind of get things going? Well, there's really only one thing that you have to know, and that's that you don't write a future story. You can't do that because it doesn't work. You have to design it. And the difference between writing and design is that when you're designing, you're thinking about all of the constituents in your business every single one and you're trying to find solutions that make it better for everyone a good design is one that leaves everybody better off it's the leader's job in my opinion or the person telling the future story to figure out what everybody needs and how to deliver it and that's what the story is about it's not about what the leader wants it's not about what the shareholders want it's not about continuing some legacy operation or you know, in business terms, keeping a, a pay plan or an incentive plan in place. It's all about giving people a replete view of the future that they can understand so they see how the whole thing works and what their part in it is. There are a few people that have done this before. One of them was Kennedy. We talked about him and his moon launch. 
we will send a man to the moon, and before the end of the decade, he said that with a funny accent, we will bring him back safely. So that was the mission. That was the reason for being. And from that, so much stuff came out. And Jobs did the same thing with the iPhone. He didn't just invent the case. He didn't just sell the glass. He didn't just have an app. He did the whole thing. He invented new businesses. He created new partnerships. They developed new ways to manufacture aluminum, which is a continuous process. It's very expensive to get aluminum started and more expensive to stop it. But they figured all that stuff out and they got it to fit in the palm of your hand. And now it's like half the size that it was before. So amazing stuff. And Disney did the same thing. We're going to look at something Disney did in just a second about how he designed his business and told his stories. But he did theme parks. They've got cruise lines. I wouldn't be surprised if Disney has an airplane service sometime in the future. They have magazines, uh, streaming subscriptions. They just, you know, while we're in this pandemic, the parks are failing, the hotels and the cruise lines are dying. But the Disney Plus subscriptions, they have 55 million subscribers. Talk about agile. Talk about story. Their, their whole content is story, and it's all make-believe. It's amazing. And we've had the same thing with Amazon and finally with Tesla. You know, you have to build the entire industry to make people want to join in that story. But when they see a glimmer of hope, when they get clarity about what their role is going to be and how the future is going to work, it's really cool. And what you're doing is you're connecting people to their future, which is very important to them. They care a lot about their futures. Their work future in particular makes them happy or sad, engaged or not. It teaches them things. It creates new options in their lives going forward. So pretty important things. So, oh, there's the Tesla picture. All right. So there are six things that I want you to think about. And first I want you to know that what I'm going to give you in these, I'm going to show those six steps again in a second, but this is not a process-based game plan. So it's not like you can get to um, the future by doing step A, B, C, D, and E. It's not agile programming. It's not waterfall. It's not Primavera or project management or any other tool you know like Asana or Monday or whatever. It's not process-based. It's design-based. And when you're telling stories, you're using them to help describe a future that you design. And for it to work, people have to see that it works. They have to see the whole thing. So what I'm sharing with you in these six steps are things that leaders need to be thinking about, things that the lead storyteller needs to be focused on in order for the whole thing to work. Now, if you look at these next six steps and you go one, two, three, four, five, six, it's not going to get you an outline. It's not going to get you your rough draft or your final paper like you learned in school, but just bear with me for a second. Let's go through these for uh, The first thing that leaders have to do and good story crafters need to pay attention to is they need to know what their customers want. Clayton Christensen, who wrote The Innovator's Dilemma and I think The Innovator's Solution, which was all about innovation, recently released one of his other methodologies called Jobs to be Done. And a lot of people responded saying, well, we've been doing that for a long time. And it's true. A lot of people think this way. But his idea is that a, a customer hires a business or an organization or a church or a hospital to do a job for them. And if you don't know what customers are hiring you to do, how can you really serve them? Now, we live in a very changing world right now. Because of people being sheltered at home, they're more self-sufficient. Because restaurants have closed, and when they open again, we're going to probably have some new rules about that. Um, delivery services are doing great. Piano tuners are starving. People who repave parking lots, believe it or not, are doing great because there's no traffic, and it's a great time to repave parking lots. So there's just so much of this change, but you've got to know what your customer really wants. And that just doesn't mean what they're going to pay for or what they bought yesterday or what you think they want. You've got to really dig in and find out how what you're doing meets their needs. You also need to know how they want to feel because if you're telling a story, making a video, putting people into some kind of a live experience, those are all forms of story, you need to make sure that you give them clues so that they can feel something. You know, if you have a professor talking to you, kind of like I'm talking to you right now, um, it's hard to get a lot of feeling from that. 
But it, were I to switch into storytelling mode and tell you what happened to my first client or how somebody responded to this new idea that he tried, all of a sudden you'd be super engaged. You've got to know those feelings because you can't build a good story without them. Your rules of the road, uh, this is basic um, script writing and dramaturgy. You need to know how your new world is going to work, what the rules are. You've all probably seen the movie with the tall blue people in it uh, called Avatar. James Cameron, who is the director and a big part of the production team, commissioned a work, and I don't know the name of it, but it was very thick, I heard, and it was the history of the Navi people. The Navi were the tall blue people who lived in this uh, other world on the floating mountain, whatever it was. I think it looks like Australia, but I'm not sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he had this work commissioned, and it explained how the Navi live, how they get married, how they make babies, what they believe, how do they ar settle arguments, uh, what do they eat, those kinds of things. What are their rituals as they pass through the stages of life? Those were the rules of the road. In business, you need to know the rules of the road. You need to know how we're going to reward people, how we're going to market to people, who's going to do this, that, and the other. So you've got to know those details. Now, typically, what leaders do today is they'll say, I know, I'm going to lead. We're going to go... Uh, increase our sales by 20% and we're going to add this new product. Okay, thank you very much. Go do your work and I'll see you in a little bit. Thank you. But that doesn't work in a changing environment. If everything's the same, that works because you're basically asking your people to do a little bit more with a little bit less. So optimizing, prioritizing, deciding fast, all those things matter. But if we're working in a world where we don't know what tomorrow's going to be like or who our next competitor is going to be or what our customers really want. You can't use yesterday's measures and yesterday's practices to kind of figure out what's going forward. That's the hard part of storytelling. That's where there's a lot of discussion. You don't just make it up and tell a story. It's not like lying or doing a bedtime fairy tale. You're designing. You're figuring out how's the future going to work and how am I going to share it with people in a way that they can buy into it? That was one of the, I'm pointing over here because that's where the chat is in my world. Some of the questions were about, like, help me get some buy-in. Well, to get the buy-in, you don't have to convince people. You have to do some of their work for them. You have to answer some of their questions for them. That's how, that's how the story thing works. Um, you've got to be adaptive. I'm going to skip over the next couple here, come back for the next webinar, because I just feel we're spending too much time on the slide, Steve. Um, we can do more of that in a little bit. Um, and the last thing you need to do is create heroes. Creating heroes is something that all of you can do. The only thing you have, there are only two things that you have to do to create heroes. The first thing you have to do is put them in the center of the story. So instead of staying, um, next week when you come in, we're going to have uh, new furniture and you're going to have to find your new office. You could say something like, and bear with me, I'm making this up as we go, um, next week you're going to have the opportunity to work the way you want. We want you to go into the check-in area check around with your friends, see what kind of furniture you'd like, where you'd like to sit, think about your teams, and then uh, push this button and somebody will deliver the right furniture for you to the right place. And if you want to change your mind, that's okay. See the difference? One, you're being told what to do. The other, you're an integral part of deciding how you're going to live at work and how you're going to do your work and who you're going to do it with. And you get to pick your chair. What's wrong with that? That's a much better story to tell. But you have to think that through because you have to build the processes that let the chair reservation and delivery of the desk and the you know changing all happen. That's what Steve Jobs did. That's what Disney did. That's what Elon Musk did with the first you know heads up display inside of a car. Those kinds of things. So that's that's the fun part. All right. So how do you know what your customers want? Hire a researcher. But when you get that information, <laughs> there are other ways, other things too. But I want to show you this other slide here. One of the most important things you can do when you're telling a story about how your business is going to change is come up with a reason for being. This is the core of any story about the future. A reason for being explains the value that you create, for whom, and what they do with it. Those three things. And that constitutes a system. There's a lot of work in systems thinking and adaptive enterprise to support this point. It's the way more dynamic organizations are being built. And every example that I gave you so far is heavy into this 
work on designing organizations, not running them like old fashioned railroads, which by the way is where a lot of our American business thinking came from. It's about the regiment of running the railroads on time so the trains wouldn't crash. And if you need a, a demo of that, it's like they only have one rail, and if they don't send them at the right time, they lose two trains and a lot of people die. So it was very important to be regimented. That's one of the reasons, according to the business historians, why we're, we're so anal about all of that stuff. So switching to this design thing is, uh, is challenging and worthwhile. iPay is a bill pay company um, based in uh, a little town in Kentucky, and they thought that their job was to sell cheap software to, I don't mean cheap as in poorly made, but in, soft, sell software inexpensively so their platform provider could sell it to community banks and credit unions. Not the big banks, the little banks that serve people directly. After some conversation, what we learned is that it wasn't their customer that mattered. It was the depositor, the person who used the bank and stroked checks and had an account in that institution. So by switching the design point, from the person who wrote them a check to the person that mattered most, the end customer, it changed their entire business. It changed their story. It changed how they organized. It changed the rules on the inside. And uh, it was absolutely amazing for them. One of the things that happened is that they doubled their profit, their sales, their employee count, and their accounts year over year for about six years. And when I started with them, they were at about 30 million a year of turnover, and they sold for 300 million. And part of it was this notion of being agile, and part of it was being able to tell new recruits, new leaders, new customers how they were wired. And this was the core of their entire story. And here's that Disney thing that I alluded to. Um, what you're seeing on the screen here, and you might want to get really close, um, is a picture, of, I call it a promise map of how Disney saw the different parts of his 2B empire working. Okay, Now take a look in the bottom left hand corner. It's dated 1957. So it doesn't have cruise lines and interactive and web services and streaming. It doesn't have all kinds of things like that. It doesn't have Broadway shows. But just read any of the little lines in between the big squares and you'll see how rich his sense of how these parts work together really were. Um, so for example, um, the film studios, if you look to the bottom right, there's a line that kind of angles off to the right. It says, provides article material to Walt Disney Magazine. And then Walt Disney Magazine owes Disneyland some advertising. And then Disneyland owes merchandise licensing, um, concessions and license, you know, like cups with ears on them and all those kinds of things. So you can see how circuitous this all is, but it's not random. It was done by design and it made a really big difference because what Disney did is he put people ahead of process and people ahead of profits. And speaking of that, the stock price for Disney in 1961 was 20 cents a share. Last year it was $153 a share. An hour ago, it was down to 101. But this number hasn't changed. The market cap in 1961 was 1 1.5 billion US. It's now $250 billion. And even over that amount of time, that is a huge rise. And this is a company that's probably not going to disappear in any of our lifetimes. All right, a couple more things I want to share with you. Remember, we talked about how important emotions were. You've got to be able to get people to feel something when they're in a story. That's why we have all kinds of literary devices and we have people crying and costumes and sets and we put them in situations and everybody's wired for story. They want to know like what's going to happen to the heroine or to the hero or how are they going to react to that. So there's emotions involved and that's the part that we pay attention to as humans. We always want to know what's going to happen next. Or why did so-and-so do that? That's just kind of how we're wired. So each brand, each story can have an emotion. So we did this store of the future for the company that you can, you can see the products here. The models are, their, their eyeglass lenses are changing color. That's what transitions lenses do. And they see when they are, the little molecules in the glass are hit by UV light. They actually change their orientation. And that's what polarizes the lenses and makes them go dark. 
But in the store of the future, before we picked up our pens to figure out what the furniture was like, the software, the shape of the store, or even what the programming was going to be like, the different things that you could do in it, we came up with this emotional conduit. And we wanted people to feel welcomed, informed, like learn about the product, astounded by trying it on. The big problem with transitions was that you couldn't try on the lenses before you bought a pair and had them custom ground to your prescription. So we solved that problem with some cool technology and we wanted people to feel better off. And we felt that that sequence of emotions would inform, it would um, delight, and it would create ambassadors out of everybody who went to the store. All right. So what does this all mean for leaders like you guys? I don't remember. Let's look at the slide. I was going to tell you something, but I forgot. So here we go. <laughs> the first thing you need to do as a leader is you need to think like your customers and employees. And for some leaders, that's really hard. And if some of you on the call want to meet with each other or chat with Steve or, you know, get together in a workshop with story miners or whatever, we can create these environments where everybody can be thinking about themselves, but you'll be thinking together and we can help you make the transition from using your biased, I've always thought about my business, I've always thought about what's most important to me and start thinking like your customers and employees. You have to understand what the effect on them is. The second thing is to make sure that you do the design work before you delegate. Now this is a traditional, the, the delegation thing is a traditional management practice that's still taught today. You know, get into a position of power, tell other people what to do, and or just tell them what you need done or the outcome that you want and let them do it. Well, that leads to tremendous amounts of cacophony and huge misunderstandings. You know, there are just, there are hundreds of stories, thousands of stories about how people delegated before the idea was ready. Maybe the idea sucked. You know, maybe turning left was not the right thing to do, but they delegated, and then that person delegated, and that person delegated in a multi-tier organization. And the last person's not really sure what they're doing or why, but they don't want to lose their job, and they want to keep their compensation, so on they go. The third thing, and this is the, the writer's trick, is to make sure that context is clear for everyone. So where are we? When are we? Where do we come from? Where are we going? If the leaders who are crafting these stories, and sometimes with the help of just professional storytellers, would constantly keep in mind that every time you introduce something new, you need to share it with people. Um, I'm going to step to the side for a second and just share a thought. If you're a leader, for every minute you spend on your strategy, you need to spend another minute communicating and sharing it. So if in your plan you've got, you know, I'm working on this for two weeks solid, you need to spend two weeks solid. If you're doing five hours on this, you need to be communicating with people for five hours. That's a really good balance to make sure that you don't get too far ahead of the class. Um, I want to give you a quick example to make this thing really lock in. And I want to use Steve. Can you pin yourself for a second, Steve? This is just for fun and to embarrass you. Are you ready? Sure. Right, so spotlight yourself. And um, I want you to put uh, a hand up like this, okay? And each one, of, just put your palm up. Make sure people can see it right in front of your face. And each one of those folks is a mountain climber. And if you're climbing up K2, go ahead and move your hand to the bottom and then let it crawl slowly up the top of the screen. You're climbing, 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 climbing. And then, the stop, the person on your thumb falls down. Oh my gosh, drop your thumb. Boom. What happens to the other four climbers? Nothing. They're safe because they're all tied together. There's something about going in a team that makes that work really, really well. I'll switch back to me for a second. So you've got this... You've got this, are we on me? Is it working? Yeah, there you go. So um, you've got this team going and they're all tied together. So here's the leader and here are all the team members. And as long as everybody's tied together, you all make progress. But if the leader cuts the belay lines and just goes up by himself, the rest of the team is way down here and they can't do a thing. So you just can't go as fast as the leader wants. It just doesn't work. The leader has to go at the speed of the organization. And that's why more communication is better. So thanks for letting me share that story. We're almost wrapping up here. There we go. So the last thing is to remember to make 
your frontline folks, your employees, your prospect, your future customer, the person you're trying to influence, they need to be the hero in the story, not you. So the one person in the world, and I, I'm going to get a little political here, I hope it doesn't offend anybody, but the one person this story would not work for, this approach wouldn't work for, is our president, Donald Trump, because every story is about him. He can't make other people the hero. He's just not wired that way. That's not his strong suit. So for all of the rest of us, the more you put people into the role of hero and the more you tell their story of ascending the ladder to success, the more you're talking to the Harry Potters when you're Dumbledore, the more you're talking to the Luke Skywalkers when you're Yoda, the more you're talking to the Moseses when you're the Almighty. That's the way to do it. So remember that you're not the hero. The story is all about them, and they need to be front and center. So here's some things that a future story will do for you on a personal basis. Even if you don't finish the process, you will make progress in all these areas. You'll struggle less. Whatever your strategy is, will probably have a better chance of success because you've done the work of getting it ready first for a story. All right? And this is what I wish for you guys. I'd like for each of you to please try um, one idea. We'll give you the slides later. or Actually, there'll be a video, so you can just kind of check them out right there. Try one idea. That's my only ask. You can do more if you want to, but just try one thing and pay attention and see how it makes you feel. See how other people respond. Then come back, try something else. I, I can almost guarantee without exception that it's going to have a, a, an amazing effect on your ability to achieve those goals that you wrote about in the chat. All right, Steve, back to you. Wow, that was really, really thought-provoking, Mike, and, and valuable. Um, so I'll just try and manage this here. So can you see both of us on screen, Mike, equally, or have I done this incorrectly? Um, I'm going to put my screen, I'm going to click on gallery view, and now I can oh, that, see that was, the okay. Okay. There we go. That's all I wasn't doing. Um, so look, we'd love you to uh, make any comments in the chat box, not the Q&A, the chat box, um, or any questions that you have. Mike, I took some notes as you were talking, and I'll, I'll, I'll just maybe raise one or two of these while people are mm -hmm. typing in their comments or questions. Um, we've done a lot of think, thinking about culture, and this is an issue I think that Michael raised in one of his comments. And it's our view, and I, I, I was gobsmacked, gobsmacked by the synergy of what you were just sharing and what I'm, what I'm about to share. And our view is that there are four cultural attributes, given our context now, there are four cultural attributes that organisations must focus on. And we think there are a few exceptions to this, given our current context. And the four attributes are transparency in the face of fear, uncertainty and stress that people are feeling right now, organisations must be transparent, both in terms of what's happening to the individual and the organisation. So transparency is one. Mm -hmm. Agility is another. Organisations, if, if organisations don't get good at being agile, cutting red tape, cutting all the, you know, cutting in necessary procedures, mm -hmm. then they're doomed. The third is creativity and innovation. So we've got to get smarter and, and encourage creativity from all levels. And the fourth is support and care. Again, in the face of fear, uncertainty, um, massive stress, we've got to support our people. And that includes the leaders. Now, the synergy that I see, Mike, is that what you're sharing with creating future stories is that touches three of those four elements and it has reper repercussions in the fourth. That is... In becoming transparent, we can also incorporate stories about the future. Um, in becoming edge, you know, I think this, the, the future stories thinking has application in pretty much all of those domains. Is that a fair comment or not? Oh, I, I absolutely think it is. And the other thing that I think both of our, and we've known each other for a while and had some professional chats, you know, um, the other thing is that both of our ways of work are aligned around making a difference and call it earning adoption. So an adoption assurance is, I guess, the category that I'd put both of these things in. 
so many people work very hard on just getting the idea done, the building built, the report finished, but they don't worry about, does it actually work in the real world? So when you're going through the, the hard work and the meaningful and fun and rewarding work of architecting your culture, um, working on the things that matter to people on the inside, you know, you're not building deliverables or software, but that stuff really matters. And the same, the, the story notion is very, very similar. It's all about earning adoption. And you do that by, as, as, um, as the, I guess I'd say the author or the architect, the strategist, the leader, you have to pick your code. And I love the way you captured those four parts about culture because I could sign up for those at heartbeat. Those are just like, those are universal truths for being human. Those are great. So we do have some comments here. Um, so Ian has said, um, love the design emphasis and the overall process. Also love Disney Promise Map 1957. I think you said well done Stephen Mike and I know Ian had to leave early so that's a nice uh, thought Ian thank you Philip while I've been viewing this presentation my staff have been emailing each other regarding an issue where customer needs cannot be met due to constraints of current practices and systems a great starting point for me to begin designing a new story that's lovely isn't absolutely, it absolutely yeah yeah I wish we had multi-way chat that would be a great one to hear about but um, we talked about how important it is to understand without bias what your customers want. Well, because of all the pivoting and changing and sickness and infrastructure and shutdowns, things aren't, they don't need to go back to the way they were. And every day we're in lockdown, people are realizing how much more they can do and how they can get things done other ways because we're very curious, inventive people, this human species that we're all part of. And we watch what everybody else is doing and we're making adjustments already. You know, there are a lot of people that are not going to go back to the barber. They're just going to do it themselves. <laughs> uh, so Daniela has said, how can I read more about your work, please? So this, it's resonating, Mike. Uh, good, haven't good. really penetrated for me as yet, but so Mike, we'll, we'll finish off this by giving people details about how they can learn more about this. Absolutely. Um, Ian is saying tracking progress as you go is, I believe, critical. Any thoughts on how this, how to track engagement in the future story? You know, this might sound a little roundabout for you, but we've done this twice and it's been phenomenally well received. Have you ever seen a movie that you really like? And then a couple months later, or when you get the DVD, there's a movie about the making of the movie. They're very popular in the Marvel franchise. It gives people like a, a, dif like a different perspective to kind of see what was going on. It's pretty neat. Um, there's a, a vampire series coming out. What, what's the one that was so popular? I forgot the name of the television show. I can't show. help you there, Mike. I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know. I, I never... Uh, Dark Shadow. I, I can't remember what it was. But they're doing... They're rebooting the whole franchise, but they're telling it from a different character's perspective. It adds a tremendous value. So if you're working on a major project, not a little one like, you know, the ice cream store around the corner, but really big one, like we're not doing any more uh, gas-powered cars. We're going all electric, not in 10 years, but in two years. I would start capturing the story on the inside. That's very motivating. What were the challenges that people faced? How did they get through them? What were they thinking and feeling? And then check in with them a little bit later. So it's not like you can just write a story, pop it in, boom, it's ready. It needs to be designed as an experience. So when wow. I think about that, how do you track engagement in the future story? You don't track engagement in the story. You engage people to be part of making the future. It's real. It's not a story. But you capture that, like those making of the movie things, and then other people can start to see it. So I hope that makes sense. Let Thank me know you. if it does or not. Um, there you go. Freya has helped us out. Twilight, Mike. How there you go. Not know yeah. that? <laughs> Very good. So, and I know that none of the characters, so I, I just know that they're doing it from another character's perspective. I think it's going to be one of the elders on the side or something. So, Mike, while people are continuing to write, I'll hog you then. Um, mm -hmm. A note that I made is strategic plans and future stories. Are they completely anathema or can we bring them together in creative ways or are they different? What's the relationship? What a setup question. One of our offerings is called strategy as story. So, <laughs> yes, they are. They're like... They're, they're very tied together, very tied together. And um, what I believe is that um, 
because humans are wired for story, um, we, we have to remember that we're not business automatons or pieces of software or cogs in a machine. We're human beings. And the way that we like to get information is a little bit different. So if you really know your strategy, McKinsey style, okay, you can only go so far with it. You rely on other people to do the execution work and to figure out all the stuff. In times that are very much the same, when things are kind of steady, even if there's high growth, like I'm sure that Australia has an interstate or inner, what's the word? I forgot, province? Um, now state, we're states. Okay, interstate highway system. And it probably started in the 60s or 70s and it might still be continuing. But as soon as that project started, you needed gas stations and restaurants and hotels. Gas stations, restaurants and hotels. So no matter how fast the real estate folks and the developers um, built those out, it was the same thing over and over again. So it was an exercise in speed. And um, I lost my train of thought, Steve. Oh yeah, so in, in, I got it, I got it. In, uh, when you're not making changes to the given circumstances, you know, strategy can be delivered that way. But when you're pivoting, and when all of a sudden you're doing, um, like I'll just pick some of the things in my neighborhood. Some of the restaurants have gone from specialty foods, like we only do Asian food, to they'll do um, eggs and biscuits in the morning, sandwiches at lunch, and something else at dinner, and now they have a food truck. All during the pandemic, they moved super, super fast. So when you're doing that kind of change, where it changes your market position, your people have new roles, you need new processes, even different kinds of accounting and different pieces of software. A story is the way to get everybody engaged so that everybody's actually building it. You don't just push a button and it turns on. All of these things require the energy, the invention, and the, the purpose and power and interest of your folks. You've got to earn their buy-in because if, you, if they don't buy in, you either have to go find new resources and you still have to earn their buy-in or you're not going to get anywhere. So the lingua franca of strategy, in my opinion, for frontline employees in a new world, in a new situation, is story. They want to hear a story. They want to know, how does it affect me? How is it going to be different? What do you expect of me? When this happens, you know, too many customers come in, how do I handle that? You can deliver that information in a story. You don't need to make them read this manual and that manual and that manual and so on. It's all, it's all one life for them. I love it. Um... I'm just reading Ian's here. Got it. Does make real sense. Helps drive engagement through participation. Um, so continue if you want, but I'm going to hog Mike while you're not. This applies. Mike, am I right in thinking at its simplest, this is... You're never wrong, Steve. So the answer is probably yes. Go ahead. Well, we might break that rule right now. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering, is this at its very simplest level... Um, communication to all parties via the best stories we can craft and design? You know, it is, but when I hear you say it that way, it feels to me, and it might not be your intent, but it feels to me like the stories are already made and you're just sharing a story off the shelf or one that you already have, kind of like using a playbook for a football team, a soccer team, or a business. We have to create those new things. And what I'm hoping to accomplish as a, as a, positive effect on the world with future story is to wake up some leaders and have them realize that they can't abdicate their responsibility for telling their folks where they're headed and the best ways to get there and how this is all going to fit together. You can't just do it happenstance. You need to dig deep and make their jobs easier and more enjoyable. You've got to put people first ahead of profits and process in design. And don't take me wrong, I'm not giving up on all my capitalist upbringing. I think it's important to make money. That's a lifeblood. But when you're designing something new, if you design around make the most money, you're basically trying to take as much money out of the system as possible, and that will move your business away from the needs of your customer. And that's why over half of the Fortune 500 aren't there anymore in just the last 10 years or so. They continue doing what they've been doing for so long without a change and the market changes and who cares? They don't care. They don't care about those old companies. So if you want people to care about you, you have to care about them. And I want the leaders 
to start designing their way forward. And I want them to use the talents inside of their companies. I want them to wake up and listen to what customers are saying now about today and what they want tomorrow and do those customers jobs to be done. Your company is in business not to make a profit. I totally disagree with that as an end game. Your business is in business to create value for those it serves. Profit is a measure of you doing that well. It's your prize, it's your counting system if you like, but you're in business to make other people happier, more money, more successful, to help them advance, to make them feel good. Those are all valid outcomes for people. That's what I hope we get with the future story. Terrific stuff. Um, and this also applies at a macro and a micro level. Am I right there? Absolutely. And thanks, thanks for bringing that up. That's a really good observation. Um, in my opinion, there's no need for a different rule set between most large companies and startups. They go through a lot of the same issues. And if you can master this idea of being agile, of um, unlocking creativity, and the other things that you mentioned around culture, you can't not be better off. Can I give you an example from Atlanta? Sure. Um, we have a, a now very famous chicken sandwich restaurant company called Chick-fil-A. It's C-H-I-C-K-F-I-L-A. And they say they didn't invent the chicken, just the chicken sandwich. And they started about almost 50 years ago in, with one location, um, and then they opened it a mall. And now they're like, a, I think, a $12 billion company with thousands of locations in multiple countries. And it's absolutely amazing. The company was built on um, Christian principles. And one of the values that they put into their culture was hospitality. So it's always, uh, if, you, if you say, oh, thank you very much, they won't say you're welcome. They'll say, my pleasure. And uh, if you're a struggling you know, with two kids and you've got too much food, they'll walk around from the back of the quick service counter and they'll take your tray and they'll help you to the table. So they're just wired for hospitality. They do things that you just don't see in anything but the nicest, you know, white linen tablecloth restaurants in fast food. It's amazing. So what's interesting is on purpose, a few years ago, they saw that the world was changing. This is about like eight or nine years ago. And the, the eldest son, who's now leading the organization, decided to add a new pillar to the culture. And it was innovation. And they, over the course of the last 10 years, have innovated and innovated and innovated. They bought an old like uh, warehouse close to the airport and they, they decked it out with kitchens and they do all their prototype services and cooking and new equipment and all of that. And they bring people in from the field and from their customer bases and they do research. They've been one of our clients before. We help them in a very, very small way look at how the customer experience would change with digital menu boards and with digital drive through so because they brought innovation in so slowly, but completely into their body, they absorbed innovation. It's now a strength. It's now a pillar of that. And they're able to do things like this, okay? Pandemic, drive-through only. They had already done a trial with um, meals that you can take home. So now when you go get your sandwich, you can get a little box with meals for two and you prep it. It's all fresh ingredients. And 25 minutes later, you have a sit-down table meal. Boom. And they've got other ideas coming out as well. So they, once you get that new capability, you can respond in so many different ways. You can't just jump to Agile. You've got to have the capabilities in place to do it. So, Brilliant. Brilliant stuff. Well, we're coming to a close time-wise now. So if any of you would like to make any other comments, um, I'll tell you what would be nice. And I saw another gentleman do this recently. And this is... I hope this doesn't sound too imposing, but if you could take a photograph of your um, computer with Mike and I here, um, I don't know if any of you have pondered the fact that uh, the world has changed for all of us, and that includes Mike and me. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know about you, Mike, but my diary just fell off a cliff because all my <laughs> bookings went, gone. So this is a new medium for, certainly for me, and Mike, I know you've geared up um, in a big way to make this your primary vehicle now for your work. Mm -hmm. Have I got that right? Yes, and I have been to Australia and I want to go back, so I hope this is, some of it's over soon because I, I really do like that. So, so look, um, that's a long way of saying if you could take a, um, a, a photo of your computer with Mike and I on screen, we could maybe 
um, use that. I don't know, but that'd be a nice little touch if you could do that. Laurie has just made a comment. This is flipping my brain in very cool ways. Our organisation is child serving, public service, orienting their story to adults is the work we do. Thinking from a systems lens in story format is giving my head a great workout. Well, that's a lovely comment. Well, hey, um, Mike. Laurie, I'm, I'm, I'm glad your head's flipping. Um, I want to send, if you'll pop your, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll give you my email address and if you'll send me yours, I will send you a, a little booklet that we did for a religious day school. And it used the, uh, the, the future story that we told was how cool it was to be a kid in that school, but we wrote it so the parents could understand it because it really was the recruiting brochure. So let me share that with you. It might give you some more ideas really specifically to the age group and audience that you're working with. So if any of you have uh, been kind enough to be able to take the photo, um, you could email me at steve at ugrs.net, steve at ugrs.net. There you go, it's in the chat box. And Mike, if people want to contact you, how do they do that? Yeah, they can um, take a look at our website. Um, and here's my email address, mike at storyminers.com. I'm giving you my phone number. You know, please don't post that on social, but you're more than welcome to just call. Remember, the time zone is uh, GMT minus <laughs> five. <laughs> yeah. Mike, you wouldn't believe the number of phone calls we've had over the years from the US. In the first, the first comment, when I uh -huh. pick up the phone rather sleepily because it's three o'clock in the morning is, oh, sorry, did I wake you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hello, I'm Mr. Rude. <laughs> you might have thought about that before you pressed the dial button, but anyway. Oh, that's so funny. So fine. Hey, so Steve, it's a real me. pleasure for me. It's, it's always great to work with you and our stuff just kind of just naturally combines. I think we're both sensing a little bit about what the world needs. So I, hope well, you know, I, I was serious at the start when I said I wasn't really au fait with the story miners dimension or the future stories dimension of Mike's work because uh, I'd only been exposed to other dimensions. He has many strings to his bow, um, but this is wonderful, Mike. This is really brilliant. Great, thank you. Thanks. Uh, people thanks. are supporting that. So hey, can, I, can I ask our studio audience a question? Sure. All right. I'd like to ask everybody two questions and just give a real quick answer, please. Um, what is a future story? Go. What is a future story? You don't have to write a future story is, just start right after that. A future story is blank. And Steve, let me know when we get three or four responses in. I've got one more question. Wide open. Or wide, full stop, open. Maybe the time thing is an issue here, Mike, because, um, you know, people have diaries and, may, and it is just gone not, um, nine o'clock here. So we're just over the hour. So maybe okay. that's the, well, the, the other question is, uh, what's your big takeaway? If anybody's still on, what's the one thing that you heard today that matters the most? That's great feedback for me. It helps me improve. And it's something Steve and I will discuss too. So uh, Mike, Michael has just we, written uh, a future story is hope. That's lovely. That's really nice. Many thanks, Mike and Steve. Very thoughtful and provoking. So there you go, Mike. Great stuff. Um, thanks, everyone, for uh, signing up. Mike, thank you. Uh, really do appreciate your insights today. Um, really valuable Absolutely. insights. I know everyone agrees. Uh, for those of you who uh, are on my list for our newsletter, um, we're doing more of these um, virtual conversations. So um, you'll hear about those. But um, Time to start designing, so many topics for me to consider. Thanks, Philip. Um, you've got people thinking, Mike. Uh, thanks very much for your time. Wonderful, thanks for sharing your platform. Take care, bye everyone. Bye everyone, bye bye. Yeah.